we're going to have tonight um, is James Hoke. Uh, prior to teaching, James Hoke was a dishwasher, a cook, a dog worker, a social worker, and a shepherd. His poems have appeared in numerous journals. He is the recipient of fellowships and scholarships from the Breadloaf Writers Conference, Swanee, and the Summer Literary Seminars. If you don't know what these are, these are sort of annual conferences of, of, of great esteem. Um, his, he received a 2007 NEA grant, as well as a grant from the Pennsylvania Council of the Arts. His first book, A Parade of Hands, this one, won the Gerald Cable Poetry Award. And his second book, called Miscreants, um, also is out recently and has been, is an absolutely wonderful book. Um, he lives in Nyack, New York, and runs the creative writing program at Ram Poe College in New Jersey. Miscreants, his new book, is set in the working class, decayed towns of New Jersey and Pennsylvania, and is a book of boys. Boys looking for fun, boys getting in trouble, boys dragged into tragedy. The poems reflect their setting and their characters. These are lean, tough poems, stripped of adornment. Yet, that very virtue, that leanness, provides much of their power. Think of, you know, like a tree in winter, you know, kind of stripped of its leaves against that white snow. Or think of kind of the lonely single note of a seagull's call. Um, it's that kind of singular power. These are not chatty poems. Instead, they're like sort of the smart, tough kid you know, who's always leaning against the wall, watching. The kid who barely talks, but when he does, everybody listens. At the heart of the book, there is a long poem telling the story of a boy who's abducted, raped, and murdered, and how this tragedy reverberates through the community of family, friends, and neighborhood. In lesser hands, this kind of story might go horribly wrong. It could be sentimentalized, it could be sensationalized. But in this book, this powerful book, restraint matches anger, revelation is tempered with silence. In the end, it's a book about grief. But in my interview with James earlier, he also commented that it's a book about hope, about coming through, that grief stays with you as a part of your life, but it's not everything in life. So it was with great joy and pleasure that I introduce to you James Hope. Oh, thank you so much. Hi. Whoa. Hi. How are you guys doing? Good. All right. Uh, I'm the warm up. I don't juggle, so you're stuck with my poems. Um, here's a chatty poem, bec just because you said I don't chat. Um, it's called My Letter of Introduction to God. It's supposed to be funny. <laughs> there you go. I'm 33, Christ's age. You remember Christ. I was lucky enough to be born in New Jersey. Believe me, I'm entitled to a few things. I'd like a stone house floating on a lake for stones to shimmy and fall in the water to salvage them so I could learn masonry. Always wanted to be a stonemason, so elegant, so strong. I'd like a house in Mexico and a day for me to wake pomegranates growing in my yard. I'd like a cast iron tub, lavender and sage, for my wife Isabel to soak in. I'd like a wife named Isabel. <laughs> and a few children who look a little like me, okay a lot, but better than me. Small enough to run beneath the belly of a horse. I'd like a horse for my excessively beautiful children. And if she would agree for my wife, my excessively beautiful wife, Isabel, to ride through the streets so no one would possess her, not even me, who tried to. I'd like the streets to be empty, empty of want, empty streets, except for the horse, his odd fondness for staring into troughs, and dogs, a pack who would remind me of people I have loved and failed to love well enough the way they roam back into my life. Ones that would tend not to stray beyond my voice, and if so, would turn gentle, more caring, like the horse the children feed pomegranates. It was supposed to be funny. <laughs> <coughs> 
my father uh, taught at Overbrook High School in Pine Hill, New Jersey. He taught history. Um, he played football, uh, high school at Haddon Heights, and he had no teeth. He had a partial, you know, I don't think a lot of people know what partials are. They're like, sort of like retainers with teeth attached to them, and you take them in and out sort of like a denture. It is a, it is a kind of denture, I suppose. Anyway, <coughs> he would uh, take his, te his teeth out during class when students were being smart Alex, and then he would just smile at them, and he had these two fangs that stuck down. So they called him Jaws. That was his nickname as a teacher. <laughs> Sleeping Shark, his name is Poem. Perhaps a dream is effortless drifting, riding the easy labyrinths of current, unhounding its prey, a stay from hunger. Or maybe it dreams the way it lived, pursuing a marlin to a prison of coral, the looping shadow play, the widening unhinged jaws, sudden flash, clasp. Either way, the body gliding silent through the tank. I've seen this before. My father floating in whiskey in bed. His teeth less monstrous on the nightstand. The head of his penis like a turtle's poking through the fly of his boxers. I wanted to tuck his penis back through the opening and lie beside him, what a son was supposed to do. I put my hand on the glass, thick, one way, before the shark flinches, roused to devour anything that moves, anything made of blood. I'm going to read a bit from Miscreants. It's a basketball poem because everyone's Lynn Sane right now. <laughs> Lynn Sane. What are we doing with language? <laughs> <laughs> it's completely irresponsible. <laughs> it totally makes sense. Okay, so um, when I was younger, I, uh, I got a job uh, working as a, in a uh, group home setting for Native American kids who had committed crimes. Um, it was me, I was 23, white boy from New Jersey, and uh, a, a Sleta Pueblo woman who was like in her 50s, and seven juvenile delinquents. And um, they were my people. And uh, they were all great kids. But one of the things they loved to do, this was in uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico, or just outside of Santa Fe. We couldn't afford the property inside Santa Fe. But we, uh, what we did was uh, we loved to play ball and they love to play basketball. So it's called The Court of Forgetting. The awkward gated, the underripe, jacked up, over Jersey teenage boy spill onto the court, a slab of desert beaten in the yard of this way station at the edge of the reservation. The air guitar player, air baller, half court rim clanger, the pimple plague conjurer of nipple the Bible-thumping believer that lingerie carries the meadow scent of angels. They're talking trash, snatching loose balls, laying them softly off the plywood. The one who lobs piss from the overpass, one who siphons gasoline, huffs hours crumpled in woodsheds in warm oblivion. They're perfecting crotch grab and spit and got a mean pick and roll going on. The one who prizes mother's fingers from beer cans, one who wires pickups and ditches them in canyons, one who swaggers and stares, stone-inducing stares before crossing over and driving to the hole. They have the sweet, easy hands and pray, if only briefly, for the clean, wet sound of ball swishing net. The one who has taken his uncle's prick in his mouth, the one who showers with his sister, who lie in bunks and weep as orphans and convicts must. They are silence in the backcourt, deadly from the perimeter. They are sly jukes and dishes, cuts and pivots. They are all sweat, hustle, break, forgetting minutes, hours, 
depths they've inhaled that well in their lungs and lift now off bodies acrid and salt laden, lifting like the dust, red and hanging in the air until someone calls time and they're done and everything becomes what it was. So you applaud for tragedy, <laughs> you sick, sick people. And yeah, me too, me too. Sound of a body falling off a bridge. I can tell you there is no word for this in any language. I've asked and everyone seems to confirm its translatability Feet shuffling off a stone pillar, simple but not easy. A young tree fracturing under the sudden weight, exactly how one imagines it. And somewhere between shuffle and fracture, the silence of Scott Coke's body falling off the Normanwood Bridge, which is also the silence of stones staring up from the riverbed, where a swarm of mayflies hatches in the pre-dawn, cold dark abode of a Susquehanna morning. If you were a hatch of insects or a freshman in college and bought some pot and drove out with friends to gaze at stars riding their arc across the sky, you would know stars make a hell of a racket. Like time, like death, they scrawl inscrutable marks of light. Say you are not a hatch of insects or one of those kids wrecked and lovely, their skin's leaf-awkward sheen. Though if you were, you'd be lost in a fury of living and dying. You'll have to trust the words for the way his face twitched, went stone white, for how unbeautiful his body comprehended night, for a breath not taken, for the arrested air in his lungs. For anything else, you'll need something like a life or memory. I give them to you piecemeal, hand over hand, as if in aftermath I press each against your mouth. They taste of salt. They fall into place. They are beginning to mean less and less. They only do what they do. Cars ticking over a bridge, wheel of a flower cart knocking cobblestone. All right. I'm going to read some new stuff. It's uh, from this new manuscript I have called uh, Small Busy Flame, which is a uh, quote from Keats. Most of the book, if it's a book, is, uh, deals with my brother who, um, who was a special forces guy. And uh, the poems largely have to deal with him going to Afghanistan and some of the issues around that history and whatnot. This is called Lilies. And I want to make sure I have every single page. Because last time I read it, I skipped a page. And I had to remember it. And the poem got real weird. <laughs> <laughs> Lilies. It starts in a pretty high elevated speech. From what bed or bank or shop from what habit to adore have you placed a few just so in a vase and let go? What air of finery a simple gesture makes? The lines of rust run over the mouthy curvature and they give up a snuff of seed dusting a maple grain. It is a pleasant picture, simple as water lilies Monet set drown over years, war years, his Water lilies, of lilies, of seeing an amputee, say, on the roadside, or hearing someone gassed cough up some blood-spotted phlegm 
into a kerchief he folds like a scrap of canvas politely back into his pocket. Or was that his wife settling in, her lungs busy mired under the surface of her skin? From what well or eye does one slog forth a life? Is that my morning tea steeping? Is that my paper folded so precisely I can't tell its date? Or the name scrolled as delicate as fiddlehead, as a fiddle leafing through a sheet of war song? You write this, and already these hills littered with funerals receive another. And the hills, too, sing dying in an undying congress of birch and beetle and drought. Is that Monet's wife at my door, her lungs in her hands? Or my brother waking at night under inches of sand and sky in Afghanistan? This ain't Surf City, bro. This is the moon. Is that my country kicking some teeth in? Is that my soul prattling on about cut flowers at the breakfast table? Unwanting of brush or gaze. Even though we know what we know, What should be said? Imperiled toward what does a soul turn? What shrill? Whatever you are, you are coming late. The flowers a low flame, the vase a molotov. And there is this light leaning through a window, a quiet fire that drinks us in. Well, that's depressing. <laughs> the best thing about being a poet is to make other people feel sad and then realizing you don't exactly feel sad yourself. The joy of poetry is making other people weep, not yourself, right? Because you already know how to cry. That's a little craft lesson. <laughs> I think Jerry Stern said it. It's, oh, them supposed to be weeping. All right. <laughs> you can hear him saying that, okay? Global studies. <laughs> the school I, I, I work for, not the college, but the little unit tried to rename itself. So we came up with global studies. Nobody knew what it was, but we decided we were the school of humanities and global studies. So I wrote this poem, global studies. <laughs> Where the hell are we? One wonders. <laughs> it's a total faculty meeting poem. Where, <laughs> where the hell are we, one wonders, when one has spent the night meandering the blind alleys of some ancient city, where you wake vertiginous, not knowing what where means, let alone the you you left in the streets. It's an old scene playing on the television. A man wakes just after dawn and lingers at the railing of a hotel balcony overlooking a plaza. And when the shot demands a profile, it pans. The protagonist turns, urns still, and the sea appears behind him, beautiful in its too muchness, is one way of describing the cinema of the mid-century. Though one could say the same for early cartography. Is this lost on you, little alien? Are you lost in a volute of talking? I am speaking to you, stink bug, etching the cell of a milk glass. You don't seem to worry your home, lethal though to not know how it works, how this glass was once some earth. Yes, you, lover of filth, draining the simple thing you need. This is no way to live, I shout from my manufactured shore. It's me, your beloved eyeballer. There's Rome, Bilbao, 
Secaucus, you haven't even learned yet how to read the semiotics of dying. But you shrug in your bug shruggery way, stuck in, seeing through, trying to skirt under the heavy rim, dreaming scat and sun. And even in your dream, which I have concocted and placed a shrewd whim between us, a field between two stones, where window and sewage are the mucky regulars of entry and decay, where someone's pranked the field with one-way signs directing every which way. There's nothing I want more than to trespass, and nothing you want more than to traverse the face of a world that will not let you be. And looming behind us, the sea, the vast, improbable, common sea, blue-black as any hour of the sky. This is the last one. It's called Wedding Pinata. It's a sort of love poem. In the rented performance space, the devil's head rigged with a hanger, inverted into a question mark, under which a ring of children crouch, poised for the gathering. The guests wolf down miniature pigs in blankets, duck with Thai peppers, curried goat steeped in milk. Just as the Buddha-headed best man, leather-clad, bull-pierced, swings the sawed-off hockey stick as if carving calligraphy from air. Then the bride's father and his scotch, wielding like a terribly old knight, nearly decapitates his wife of 40 years, catching her sequin beret, her silver wig, shimmering like a mackerel in the flickering strobe as we take turns tying the red bandana over our eyes, ready to receive instruction or cigarette. Times like this, one prays there is life on other planets. <laughs> That's, <laughs> it's so true. That someday, cruising in their space jalopies, they'll sputter and stall and see with their one good eye what we all see here on the purgatory of the dance floor. Our mirrored ball, our ruin of disco, vexed in the couple, swaying, saying soft things, waiting for one lucky fool to hack and flay some hidden pleasure, some sweet rain. There you go. Thank you very much. The odds of a child being in a fatal automobile accident are 1 in 23,000. The odds of a child being diagnosed with autism, 1 in 166. The odds say it's time to listen. To learn the signs of autism, visit autismspeaks.org. When you fill someone's life with hope, you wind up adding a little more to your own. Help America's youth. Be a friend. Be a mentor. Just be there. Go to bigbrothersbigsisters.org. Are you prepared for what awaits you?
There are amazing possibilities when you open a child's mind to reading. Log on to the Library of Congress website and let the journey begin. Friends can provide the support you need to reduce your risk of cancer, diabetes, heart disease, and stroke. Eat right and get active.